Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So grateful and so thankful for the opportunity you've given us to feast upon your word together. We thank you, dear Lord, for your never-ending love that you have for us, that you'll, you'll never leave us nor forsake us, that nothing can ever separate us from you, including ourselves. I just ask that the Holy Spirit would take what is said here and filter out all of the ignorance and the foolishness, but seal to our hearts only that which is true. For it is in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans verse by verse, and in our last study together, we had reached verse 36 of chapter 8, Romans 8, verse 36. In a great sense, we're standing on the summit of a great victory. We've seen God give us over that to total depravity, that man is totally depraved, absolutely unable to remedy his condition. And in that condition, it was God who loved us and gave himself for us when we were his enemies, when we were, were not pleasing him, we were not working for him. In fact, when we were hostile to him, he redeemed us unto himself that we were, we had sinned and come short of the glory of God, but justified freely without a cause by his grace. And that we stand before him without spot. Every single Christian stands before God without spot, without blemish. We've seen that we're not under law, that sin shall not have dominion over us. And we, we found in the seventh chapter, it looks like sin does, that we have a great conflict with the flesh. And it seems as though the things that we would not do, these we allow, and the things that we would do, these we do not. And there appears the, the great declarations of victory on the part of God Total defeat, in light of total defeat, great victory. When we reach the eighth chapter, we, we find out that we face no judgment, that the Spirit of Christ dwells within us, that uh, if the Spirit of Christ doesn't dwell within us, that we're not His, the Spirit of Christ does not dwell in us because we made any decision because of anything that we've done on our part. The Spirit of Christ dwells in us because we are His. And we were His from before the time uh, that the worlds were created. We've always been His. And He redeemed us freely by His grace. Not only that, we've come to the fact that all things work together for our good. And that means everything. And we can scratch our heads to try to limit that verse. The text says that God works everything together for our good. We found that nobody can lay a charge against us because we are holy without blame, spotless before him. And if they charge us, they're charging Christ. We've also found out that the experiences through which we pass and, and the enemies that surround us cannot separate us from the love of Christ. Narrow places, pressure, difficulty, hardships, trials cannot separate us from his love. And we got to verse 36. As it has been written, and it is a perfect passive. It was written, completely written in past time 
with a result that it stands eternally written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Now I want you to think about that. Think about that in the eyes of what is called Christianity today. Now I don't want to pick on any particular thing. Think of the Vatican. Imagine that it's recognized as a nation and we send an ambassador there. Sheep for the slaughter? you got to be kidding. I would think that anybody grounded in scriptural truth would rebel in horror against such a thought. Think of modern Protestant Christianity. We want to control the government. We want to run the world. We want to write the laws. Not our point. We are ambassadors for Christ. We're sheep for the slaughter. Many years ago, I asked a question when I was a young child, why God likened us to sheep? And the illustration I got was that, well, when you, when you clean up a sheep, he stays clean. You clean up a pig, and he goes back and wallows in the mud. And, you know, the, so the sheep are nice, kindly things. And, and then I got a job working with sheep. And they weren't at all like the Sunday school class. And I thought... I'm likened to one of these ignorant beasts. I mean, you know, you got to be kidding. You want to slaughter cattle. Well, you know, they try to protect themselves and they, they run away. Sheep, though, they're like, well, I'm next. We are counted as sheep. Our job is not to run the world. Our job is not to build big organizations. Our job is not to influence government. We are ambassadors for Christ and sheep for the slaughter. He's made us the filth and the offscouring of the world system. And as I've tried to tell those who follow us on social media, people who call themselves Christian by the score are rising up trying to run the world system, not what we've been called to do. Folks, the sheep do not fight the battle. The shepherd does. The sheep don't provide their environment. The shepherd does. The sheep don't know where they're going. The shepherd does. And somehow or, or other, people have gotten the idea that Christianity is such a great thing, we ought to run the world. And we almost leave behind the fact that we are ambassadors for Christ. We don't need to fight our own battles. The shepherd does that. We are killed all the day long. The word is a present. We are constantly being killed. Sheep for the slaughter. It was the Lord himself who said that he had sent us forth as sheep among wolves. Now what chance does a sheep have against a wolf? But our shepherd is the one who protects us. He sends us forth among wolves, but he's with us. Not a place he'd send you that he doesn't go himself. There are those who were delivered from fire, those who were burned from fire, those who were delivered from slaughter, and those who were slaughtered. And the human mind wonders, because they're not confident in what God is doing. Folks, nothing touches your life that he hadn't ordained. I repeat again, God is not making decisions. He's not looking at you and seeing you do something and, and, and say, Oh, I've got to change my plan. I've got to change the plan. Everything in your life, God decided before he created the heavens and the earth, and the fact that you're sheep for the slaughter sometimes doesn't appear very pleasant. You're caught in tight places, difficult marriages, bad children. 
who knows what, caught in a drug addiction. Unbelievable what happens to Christians. But our God is faithful. There isn't any place where, where God told you that your life would be constant victory in a sense that you'd be wealthy and, and never be sick, that everything would go your way. Your father does own the cattle on a thousand hills. He is God Almighty. There's nobody richer, nobody more powerful than our father. But he never said everything's going to be wonderful in your life. He never told you that. He did tell you that you are sheep being killed all day long and appointed to the slaughter. Christianity is not a, a confident army marching to conquer the world. Christianity, folks, is the truth of those who have been redeemed by the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his obedience, he made you righteous. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. The word there is dia, by means of. Verse 37 in the King James begins with nay, it's the Greek word, but. But in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Now, now that's Christianity. Sheep for the slaughter, more than conquerors. You need to really grasp that. We are more than conquerors by means of the one that loved us, and that's Christ. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ. And how could you be more than a conqueror? Well, you can win the battle and not have much. We are more than conquerors because we not only defeat the enemy, we, we go on to glory and eternal life. We are more than conquerors because our shepherd is the God who created the world and everything in it. He's the one who knows what's best for us. He's the one who ordained us. He made you as ugly as you are or as pretty as you are. He made you as crippled as you are or as healthy as you are. If you have lots of money, don't believe for one moment that it's your wisdom that brought it to pass. It is God who gives the ability to get wealth. That's biblical. You didn't do it. God ordained it. Your responsibility is to give him the praise and the glory and the honor. If he made you poor, it was for his design. Though he slay me, yet will I wait upon and hope in him, says the original Hebrew text. Though the fig tree shall not blossom, nor fruit be on the vine, though the labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stall, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Do you know that truth? You can only know that truth by feasting on the Word of God. Listen to me, folks. The minute that you remove yourself from this book, you are at the mercy of your logic and your human reasoning. That was clearly evident in the effects of 9-11. There were blessed few Christians who recognized that it was God who ordained it and God who brought it to pass. Our problem is not to know why, but to know the one who works all things after the counsel of his own will. I have no idea why, why God does what he does. I've seen bodies racked with pain, lives that are indes indescribable. And I've seen lives where everything is victory and assurance and wealth and health. And I know the God who's ordained it, 
My responsibility is to recognize that God has laid out my path, that it is he who has made me more than a conqueror. Maybe the one with nothing knows more about the victory in Christ than the one with everything. I don't know. Listen to me, dearly beloved. My responsibility is not to judge what God is doing in your life, but to recognize that he's working in mine. I am more than a conqueror because my conqueror is Christ. I'm more than a conqueror because I didn't do the fighting. You need to understand in the verse that a conqueror is one who engaged in the battle and won. I didn't do the fighting. My shepherd is the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is he who causes me to triumph. It is he who gave me the victory, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. You know, it's wonderful how God words things. The human mind would quote the verse, I will not fear what man might do to me, isn't what the verse says. It says, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. He will, for he has said, I will never cease to sustain and uphold you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's my God. I'm more than a conqueror, for I am persuaded, says the text, I have another perfect passive. Don't miss the power of the words. I have been totally persuaded in past time with the result I remain absolutely persuaded. It's a passive voice. I don't know how many articles and how many sermons I've heard on how Paul had totally persuaded himself. He didn't persuade himself at all. And immediately the voice comes back, well, that, that might be true of Paul, but I'm not totally persuaded. You see, once again, you need to understand God's language. You need to become intimately acquainted with this book. What that verse says in its opening word, and the word is pytho, by the way, you see it in, in Hebrews 13. Obey them that have the rule over you. Better to be persuaded by them that have the rule over you. That's the, that is the word in the verse. Pytho, meaning persuade. And that's your responsibility here. Is the word being taught? Is Christ being exalted? What that verse is saying is that God in his word has given you everything that you need to know. So he has totally persuaded you. If you don't know much about this book, you don't have much persuasion. Biblically. That's truth. And that is your only source of truth. That's your only source of truth. If you wrote a book that the Bible is your only source of truth, it would hardly sell. But, you know, write some trash like, you know, surprised by the voice of God, you know, and it sells like crazy. You know, you don't need a Bible. God just talks to you. We live in a period of time which some of the great theologians have classified as the silence of God. I'm not sure I like that classification, for we have his word. And folks, I wouldn't trade places with any Old Testament saint who doesn't have the complete word of God. You have God's word. I wouldn't be without it. I praise the Lord that I can carry his word. I'd hate to think that somebody would take it away from me. It's more important to me than a, sh than a shirt or underwear or boots and a hat. How can you be persuaded if you don't know what he said? The inference in the text is that God has said enough 
So we are absolutely persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, you know the verse. I am completely persuaded with the result that I stand unswervingly persuaded that death can't separate me from the love of God. First of all, we had the love of Christ in verse 35. Now we have the love of God, another incidental indication of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, that neither death, neither death, there are people who all their lives were chained by the fear of death. We read in Psalms, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, the word is isn't there, indicating in the Hebrew that he always was. He did not become your shepherd because you made any decision. He always was. And you have the Lord, and, and he, and he, and he, until you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and then thou art with me. Why did the pronoun change? Some songwriter decides to write the new 23rd, and he leaves out one of the greatest truths of the, of the Psalms, that it changed from he to you. Thou art with me. It also points out that death is but a shadow, a shadow. I shared to Facebook, you know, would you rather be run over by a train or by the train's shadow? Death looks horrible. It, it's referred to as tragedy, disaster, but that's not true. Death is but a shadow for those in Christ. We will never die. He who believes in me, said our Lord, shall never see death. We have passed out of death into life. We have eternal life now, not someday. It's not something that's ahead of us in the future. We possess eternal life now because we are in the one who is eternal. When Christ hung on the cross, to the one thief he said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And for those people who are unwilling to take God at his word, they changed the verse to say that, well, sometime you'll be with me in paradise. He doesn't say that. You couldn't translate the Greek that way if your life depended on it. This very day you will be with me in paradise. Why should that be horrible? Why should that be tragedy? Does it matter whether I'm young or old? I am absolutely persuaded by the book that death cannot separate me from the love of God, nor life nor life. Well, now we have, now we got a problem. Christians seem to have great problems with their lives. You, you know, you, you shouldn't have that. You ought to be able to give thanks for all things. I think one of the, one of the maddest, I'm not sure if it was the worst, but one time people got terribly mad at me. I, I couldn't believe it. They called and they said, Oh, we just ran over a 12 year old girl and killed her. And I said, well, have you thanked the Lord for it? Never saw him again. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, listen to me. That is not being insensitive. That is being truthful. Don't allow your emotions to govern or dictate your response to tragedy, no matter how severe it is. If there's anything in your life for which you cannot praise the Lord, 
there's something wrong with this book. God tells me to give thanks for all things and be thankful in all things. Should I not be? Is he it, is it just using words without sense? This is God Almighty, my Heavenly Father. There are a plethora of things in my life for which it seems inconceivable to give thanks. But I do. My life, and, and I'm certain it's true of every one of you as well, has never been like I thought it'd be. Just one of the upsides, which staggers my imagination. For many, many years, I labored in college. I'm a Bible teacher by education. Never held a, a teaching position in a Bible college or a seminary. Or neither have I ever passed through a mega church. I, I'm trying to say it modestly. I once believed that if only I could teach and preach to a football stadium full of people, I could really fulfill God's calling in my life. I don't know why God does what he does. I thank God for each and every one of you. I see that these videos don't get a lot of views. Then God shows me some YouTube analytics where it says that these Romans videos have, have received 7,000 views the past 28 days. And I think, you know, that's a mega church. I was talking to an, uh, an Army vet at the VA who said, you know, the Army trained him for two years to read maps. I, I said, well, what'd you do? He said, I loaded mortars. What I know is that God laid out your life. I also know that many of you, if, if not most of you, think that you fouled it up. You know, you didn't make this this investment. You you married wrong. You didn't you didn't see that stop sign. I mean, it goes on and on and on. You know, you shouldn't have taken those drugs. You shouldn't have done this or that or the other thing. It's all your fault. None of you would blame God. I'm not blaming God. I know a God who's working in you, both the will and to do of his good pleasure. That is why that you can rejoice. That's why you can rejoice. That's why you can give thanks. And that's why you have hope. Your life isn't what you thought it'd be, you know. Marriage is a commitment, and God has committed himself to us. We see it strongly in the passage that we're looking at in the closing verses of chapter 8. He says that we walk by faith, not by sight, and that he's ordained our path. And when he has tested us, we shall come forth as gold. There's no doubt about that. So death will not separate us. Death, no problem, nor life. And I believe God is reminding us of the fact that for many of us, we see life as the problem. I remember being asked years ago to, to, to speak on death and taxes. I spoke on life and taxes. And there are many people who have decided life's not worth living. But folks, your times are in his hands and your tears are in his bottle. Neither death nor life nor angels nor angels. Now, I recognize that the word means messenger. Some Bible teachers want to say that, that angels there mean demons. You know, only angels from below. I think it means messengers of any kind, human or angelic. Whatever they are, no messenger can separate you from the love of God. You're surrounded by false gospel. You don't, you don't just get it from the entertainment media and the literature and the books you read, but, but you get it from Christian churches 
And there are those who, who believe that they get messages from heaven and from hell and whatever. There isn't a single being, angelic or human, who can separate me from the love of God. And one of my early pastors said, Steve, that's true of everybody but you. you know, you're, you're the only one that can separate you from the love of God. I said, an angel can't, life can't, death can't, principalities, powers, they can't, but I can. Wow. Yeah, you're the supreme power. And if I said Christ was the supreme power, then I got in trouble. He, he didn't want to hear that. Nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers. No. Now, there's an area where people want you to see the, the arrangement of the world that surrounds you. The spirit world, principalities and powers are used in the scriptures of principally uh, of demon activity of Satan's domain. But why can't it be principalities and powers? All powers, Satan, the government, the, the Pope, and any principality or power. I Personally, folks, I would not limit it to Satan's domain. I think it includes that. There isn't a demon, in, including Satan himself, that could separate you from the love of God. There isn't a human power that could separate you from the love of God. There isn't an, an army that could separate you from the love of God. There isn't a, an organization that could separate you from the love of God. Principalities and powers. I'm more than willing to agree that the inference is, is an arrangement of demonic power, but I believe the words mean more than that. Any power, any principality, nor things present. Now, now how is that different than life? Why is that different than life? How many times I've heard people say, if you just knew my present situation, well, your present situation is, is God's. I didn't design it, and you didn't design it. The things that are present or the things to come, that's, that's what you don't know. They can't separate you from the love of God, nor height, nor depth. And I am unwilling to limit those words. Any height you can think of, any depth that you can think of. I do agree that in, in biblical times they had an, an, an astrological significance. People run their lives by the horoscope. Christ, Christians won't walk under a ladder. I've known Christians who are terrified when a black cat, you know, runs across their, their path. So there is in those words the thought of astrological and suspicion and all kinds of demon activity. That's in the words, but I think the words also include any height or any depth. That can't separate me from the love of God, nor any other creature. That includes me. That includes me. It's as though the Holy Spirit is saying, well, look, if I've left anything out, we'll put it here. Nor any other creature is able, as the power, to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Most Christians would conclude that God loves them. You know, if somebody gave them a million dollars or, or healed them, or, or if everything was great in their life. But our text says, the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The greatest illustration, folks, the greatest truth of the love of God for you is that Christ died in your place. Would you rather have a million bucks to spend on your lusts or an inexhaustible supply of love and grace 
absolute forgiveness for all sins, past, present, and future, the truth that you stand before him spotless. Does God love me? Christ died in my place. Folks, if you evaluate the love of God by what happens in your life, you will never know the love of God. The love of God is seen in the fact that he took your place, he bore your sin, and he made you as righteous as he. If you followed through with us on these first eight chapters, I want you to spend some time thinking about just how much we have seen Christ exalted throughout this epistle so far. And that in contrast with what we may have thought God expected of, of us. Until next time, I love you all. I truly do. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.